say dinner is starting to come out. I guess I can't give an hour here right now. <laughs> Brad mentioned that the Parsha of Mishpatim is a little bit out of order. If, you were, if the Torah is chronological, from the end of Yitro, the Yisera Sedivros, the receiving of the Torah, we should go straight to the Egel Azad. And yet, it comes in a few Parshas later. So the question is, why? The simplest answer I ever heard from Rosh Salavechik, Rabbi Bimori, is that Mishpatim is the explanation of the Yisera Sedivros. It's the details. The Rav went into great detail about telling us how we're learning civil law, moral law. It's not enough just to have moral law, but you have to have the details to know how to do it. And that's what Mishpatim is, are those details. There's something else interesting about Parsha Mishpatim, and I think it fits in with the fact that we here together made a seum tonight, is in Eastern Europe, there was a preacher known as the Chevrashas. Now today we have an Amban Yomi, we have Daf Yomi. Before those existed, there was the Chevrashas. In basically every small town, every small shul, there was a group of men who after work got together in their shul, and they learned Gemara. And Shabbos especially. Shabbos morning, that was the time for Torah Shavitah. The Shabbos afternoon, you sit and you learn. Today we have Abba Subhani, so... I guess we're still doing it in a sense. But, once a year, all the Chevrashas chose one Shabbos to be their annual dinner. Malava Malka, if you like. And it was always Parshas Mishpatim, without exception. And the question is why? Now let's go back and think about it. Traditionally, when a young boy starts learning Mishnayas, he starts learning Gemara, you start in Baba Metzia, whether it's Elu, Elu Metzia, Shnai Mokasi Metalis, that's where you start. In fact, when I started at Chappelle's with Rabbi Shuren, that's exactly where we started, as they were trying to reteach me how to learn, learn Talmud. Because in America, I thought I knew how to learn Talmud, but when I got into Rabbi Hirsch, actually Rabbi Karlinski's year, I learned I didn't know how to learn Gemara. He retaught me. So where you start, is right there in the Zikin. And that's what Mishpatim is, it's the Zikin. The Rav said, the Zikin is the Iker of Torah. You gotta think about this, lots of halachas, lots of different areas that we learn. The Shabbos, all the holidays, get into Zvakim, get into Nida, get into Kulin. The Rav said, you know what, in the yeshivas in Eastern Europe, they never learned Kulin. They taught Kulin sometimes to little kids. The Rav said, I learned Kulin by osmosis. As a little kid, I heard it. Okay? Yet he, was, he taught a great Kulin shir. I wasn't Zoka to be in that shir, but I was Zoka to sit and learn Halakha and Gemara with the Rav. But every yeshiva, whether you're learning at the Mir, or my son Eli just, how many years was it there, Eli? Six, seven? Six. Six years gets through a cycle. Most of it is Nazikin. Why? We hope that little boys and young men, when they're learning about people fighting over who owns the talus that they're fighting over, will learn something about, well, we hope they learn about manners, but that they're not going to get out of that. But we hope they're going to learn about honesty. We hope they're going to learn the basics that you need to live in a civil society. And it all goes back to Nazikin. So I think today, you know, as I say, the Ahmad Yomi Shir, which I try to attend as much as I can, and when I can, thank God for technology, whether it's Zoom Alive or it's uh, recorded on YouTube. Um, one advantage recorded on YouTube is I can listen to it a couple of times, which is I'm listening to it driving, I have to. Okay, I don't get it the first time. But I'm sitting with the Gemara open in front of me, then I can get it the first time. But this is a way we can use technology for good. Technology can be very bad, but we can also use it for the good. And that's Ahmed Yomi Shir, the Halakha Shirim that Rabbi Cohen teaches in the morning. Rav Zakari Shirim, which every so often I get to join in in his Halakha Shir, like driving over the Golden Gate Bridge one day, I was sitting and listening to uh, Shir and Halakhas of uh, Beis Knesset. This is the essence of Torah. And so us having the shul making this the Malava Malpa and Parshas Mishpatim, I think is very, very 
importance. Now, there's two questions I have to answer. First of all, my wife's question. Why did I agree to be honored? <laughs> the truth is, I've turned it down several times. Finally, Brad got me in a, in a soft moment when I went home to double check with my wife. She wasn't adamant enough about saying no. We're not the type of people that like standing up for being honored. It's just that simple. Number two, when I travel, it's amazing how many people heard of Beit Shemesh and they want to know, do you live in the Ramah or do you live in Beit Shemesh? And I say, well, I live in Ramat Beit Shemesh, which is a neighborhood in Beit Shemesh. And there's actually five Ramat Beit Shemesh. Okay, which one? Ramat Beit Shemesh. Oh, oh, do you know so-and-so? Do you know so-and-so? And then the next question is, where do you dive in? And I say, at Abad Shalom. Now I realize that there's two Abad Shaloms. There's one here in Aleph and there's one in Gimel. Might confuse people more. But the interesting question is, almost every time I get asked, why do I dive in there? You know, there's a lot of shoals in our neighborhood today, thank God. When we first bought our Dira, no. Um, even when we moved here in 2006 on Aliyah, there were a lot of shoals, but not as many as exist today. And I thought about that question, and the reason I dab and adab shalom is the people, you all. It starts with Rosacharya Shemar the Asha. He is the embodiment of a living Sefer Torah and a living Shulchan Aruch. I can ask him a Shaila, he'll not only tell me where to find it in Shulchan Aruch, but where on the page. And if, it's, if I catch him one time with one that he doesn't know right off, he'll go do some research and come back to me with Mari Makomos to go research. So he is my encyclopedia Talmudit and my Bari Lawn. It's Rabbi Zakari. Second reason, I'm lazy, it's not that far a walk. <laughs> but really, it's all the people in the shul. Our shul is made up of volunteers. I gotta add something, Rav Zakarish may be a part-time rub, but I can tell you from being a part-time rub, there is no such thing as a part-time shul rub. It is a full-time job and then some. You may have a part-time salary, but it's a full-time job. And you have two or three other full-time jobs to make ends meet. It's not an easy thing, and I respect that. I also respect how our shul respects Rav Zakari. When we first moved in full time, there was a discussion trying to get the Zakharishes to move full time to the neighborhood. I guess the Rebbitson killed the idea. She liked where she was. What was amazing, though, was afterwards the officers, members of the shul, literally went and apologized to Rav Zakharish in case they had said something which was not respectful enough. There's so many shoals in America where the board thinks that they are the boss and the rub is an employee. That's not what it is around here. There is true cub of the rub. And that says not only a lot about the rub, but it says a lot about all of us here. That we know basic Jewish values. The other thing about the shul, it's run by volunteers. Lev, who was the uh, Yoshe Rush for so many years, did you ever get paid for that job? Now, I think it costs you a lot of money, too. And even today, as he's doing the newsletters and the pictures, and he's the guy who took that horrible picture of me that sits in the, in the uh, thing. Not his fault, but he grabbed me and said, I need a picture now. I wasn't all dressed up for it. I'm sure and at least had a professional picture there to put in there, you know. Brad Rubenstein, he's doing all sorts of stuff. Quietly for the show. Um, I can go around the names. Every member of the Vaughn, all are divine. The lady. I look at an Eliyahu J Jacob. Here, here's a guy who's a Talmud Tatham that can give a democracy. And he does every day. And yet he pulls out a broom and a mop and he sweeps and cleans the floor in the base measure, pulls out the garbage, keeps the place looking nice so that we can sit there and have a nice place to learn about. When I think of the Beit HaMikdash and the mitzvah that the Kohanim fought over, which is Trumat Adeshen, cleaning up the garbage every morning, right? Well, the shul is a, is a Mikdash Me'ah. It's a mini temple. So that's what he's doing. And he's doing it because it's a shul. I don't know if you clean the floor at home. I know my wife tells me I don't very I, 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 I get the vacuuming of the carpet. Thank God we don't have carpet in most of the apartment. Okay, but the sweeping, she does it. She does a great job. 
But that's the way everybody is. Kananya setting up kiddishes, fixing things that need fixing. And I'm forgetting here people, but the fact is, just the people that come to make a minion, to learn, this is what makes up the kahila. And that's all of us. And that's what makes Avat Shalom special. And bottom line, why I didn't want to say yes, but I felt I had to, because I'm just one of you. And I'm really here as your Shalit Tzibur. Now, sometimes people think the Shalit Tzibur is being honored by the congregation. It's the other way around. The Shalit Tzibur is serving the congregation. And it's a big burden. So, uh, I apologize if I haven't done my job as an honoree well enough. I also have to, like in any award ceremony, you have to say thank you. Okay, for mitzvahs, I don't have to say thank you. I say yashikov to all the people I've mentioned before, every one of us who's here. This is a Suda's mitzvah, so yashikov to all of us. I have to say thank you, though, to my family, my wife especially. The truth is, my wife does not like all the traveling I do. She puts up with it, barely. Um, but it's unfortunate. Today, food is not local. It is literally all over the world. And I'm one of those people who has the talent to supervise kosher food. And there aren't that many of us at my level. I feel, as I can do it, I still need to do it. And we work it out. My children, you have two of my sons here, Akiva and, and Ellie. That's half my sons. You've got half my daughters here, Devora and Adina. And I guess their husbands aren't here because they're home babysitting, right? Yeah. Because babysitters are expensive in this neighborhood. And they're probably all taken. The fact is, in my career as a shulrav, my wife has saved myself over and over and over again. I don't know if you realize this, but I have a horrible trouble with memorizing names. I don't have Rabbi Zatarish's memory, not at all. I don't have my wife's memory. And many a time would be, someone would come up to me, I can remember who they are, their name, forget it. And she would quietly whisper to me the person's name, or she goes, hello, Mr. So-and-so, okay? And in so many other things, my wife is my partner. She's also the most important half because she is so much more talented than I am. Um, even today, she still teaches part-time in the Shana Bet in the seminaries, Mithbalah or Beis Yaakov. If she worked full-time years ago as a nurse, also she taught in Beis Yaakov in L.A. Along with raising eight children, and I'm not going to count how many grandchildren. All I know is that every other day it seems to be we got to take two carpool for one of the grandchildren or three other grandchildren, or there's something else that needs to be done, and my wife always is able to do it. So I have to say a personal thank you to my wife, because any honor to do is mine. And I could go on and on and on like any other show rabbi, and I could even tell you something worth listening to. But I think this is a good time for me to stop. Shabbat <laughs> <laughs>